not done yet. There are two more steps. The hard one, determining which deductions relate to what income, is part of the subject of the 861 module. The other remaining step, though, is pretty easy in concept, but may require outside help to do. We must determine what foreign taxes relate to what income. This means we must apply foreign rules. For applying foreign rules, you must look to foreign law, not U.S. law. We must allocate a foreign income tax to all the income that is subject to that tax under the foreign rules. Sometimes this is straightforward, such as for a withholding tax or a tax on capital gains. Sometimes, though, the foreign concept of what is income and when it is recognized may differ significantly from U.S. concepts. So again, we have a multi-step process. First, allocate the tax to the types of income taxed by the foreign country. We might be able to stop here. Next, apportion the tax among the baskets if needed. This first requires determining what baskets of income we have and how much. We do the apportionment among the income using U.S. principles based on U.S basis income. This can produce rather odd results due to differences in U.S. and foreign rules on timing of the income and what is income. Let's do a quick example. Assume we have income subject to 30 percent foreign statutory tax rate like we did last time. Also assume the foreign rules on inventory are different than U.S. rules, causing a thousand timing difference. We have 4,000 of sales net income and 1,000 of interest income for a total of 5,000 under U.S. rules. But under foreign rules, there's 5,000 of sales net income and 1,000 of interest income for a total of 6,000. This results in total foreign tax of 1,800 on the 6,000 of income under foreign law. We must apportion this tax on U.S. income. Thus, 1,000 over 5,000 of the tax, or 360 of tax, gets apportioned to interest income. That's a 36% effective tax rate on income under U.S. concepts, even though the statutory rate is 30%. This causes the interest income to meet the high tax exception if the person earning the income is a corporation, but not meet it if that person is an individual, similar to our last example. Timing differences like this can distort the effective tax rate and the resulting basketizing of income and taxes. When our timing difference turns around, our foreign tax will be less at a lower effective rate, and the passive income will have lower tax. The higher taxes will have gone into the general basket. This could permanently reduce our foreign tax credits. Timing differences can thus distort a taxpayer's ability to use the foreign tax credit. In December 2017, there were big changes to many U.S. international tax rules. Watch my video, 2017 International Tax Changes, for a summary of the changes. These changes include three that have a direct impact on the foreign tax credit. Each of these is about deductions related to income inclusions for owners of foreign corporations. First. Credits are reduced for taxes related to the one-time Section 965 inclusion of all prior earnings by U.S. shareholders of foreign corporations. 
Second, credits are reduced for Section 951A inclusions of low taxed income from high earning controlled foreign corporations. Third, credits are reduced to zero for foreign income taxes related to dividends received by a U.S. corporation from a foreign corporation. We'll take these one by one with a little background on each. Each 10% or more shareholder of a foreign corporation must include in his, her, or its income in 2017 and or 2018 his, her, or its share of that foreign corporation's cumulative earnings and profits. The shareholder also gets a deduction of either 55% or 77% of the amount of the inclusion. If the shareholder is a U.S. corporation or elects to be treated as one, the shareholder also gets a credit for its share of the foreign income taxes paid by that foreign corporation. Those foreign taxes are reduced by the same 55% or 77%. The reduction is in the same proportion as the 55% and 77% deductions are of the foreign corporation's earnings. This is basically a one-time affair with respect to any particular foreign corporation. Big, but just once. Beginning in 2018, under Section 951A, a 10% or more U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation, or CFC, must include in his, her, or its income, his, her, or its pro rata share of the CFC's current earnings in excess of a 10% return on depreciable assets. The inclusion applies only if the earnings are not subject to high foreign tax, that is, foreign income tax of less than 18.9%. This is in addition to other subpart F inclusions. Then, under Section 250, the shareholder, if it's a U.S. corporation, gets a deduction for 50% of the inclusion. If the shareholder is a U.S. corporation, it can also get a credit for foreign income taxes the subsidiary paid or accrued on those earnings. However, the amount of taxes treated as deemed paid is only 80% of the amount that would otherwise be considered in figuring the deemed paid credits. Further, the income taxes are in a separate special basket, and there's no carryover of taxes in excess of the allowable credits for this basket. Fortunately, since the inclusion is a separate basket, the deduction under Section 250 does not adversely affect any other basket. Further, the inclusion and deduction do not count in determining an overall foreign income or loss. Finally, U.S. corporations get a 100% deduction for dividends received after 2017 from any foreign corporation. Since there's a 100% deduction, there's no U.S. tax on the dividends. There's also no credit for foreign income taxes or withholding taxes, paid or deemed paid, on these dividends. The old deemed paid credit is gone for dividends after 2017. Like the 951A inclusion, dividends from foreign corporations are not counted in computing foreign source taxable income or loss.